Hi everyone, I am Georgia Gerard, guest hosting the Rocky Mountain Myrex Short Takes on Suicide Prevention podcast today. And today we have Dr. Chris Corona who will be joining us. He is a postdoctoral fellow with, in the Vision 2 um, Center of Excellence for Suicide Prevention at the Canandaigua VA Medical Center. And today we'll be discussing Chris's research, oral injury, and how it relates to suicide risk. So Chris, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and what made you interested in this line of research? Sure. Um, so I have a, a degree in clinical psychology, so um, that's my background. I've always been a suicidologist. Um, as a grad student, uh, I was part of a lab that developed um, a suicide-specific intervention. I've always been interested in this particular topic. And this is my first time in the VA. I wanted to come to the VA because I know this is a this is a huge need in that particular population. And once I got here, just kind of in the interest of continuing my training and things that I have uh, less experience with, I wanted to learn more about uh, post-traumatic stress. And so I've been doing some clinical work in a in a PTSD clinic for most of this year, um, and have had a supervisor who's actually who first sort of taught me about this construct. He's very um, into it, and he's been doing work in a PTSD clinic for a very long time. He thinks moral injury is, is very relevant to what he sees. And as I talked to him more about it and read more about it, um, one thing in particular that struck me was how much overlap I think there is uh, between what we are starting to think about as kind of like manifestations of moral injury and things we've been studying for a long time as risk factors for suicide. So things like disruptions in social functioning, um, loss of meaning and purpose in life, feeling intense guilt and shame. You know, I think, I think you see that in both uh, bodies of literature. And, you know, the other thing I'm, I'm mindful of is that um, PTSD has is, is been associated with suicide risk. There are a lot of studies that talk about that, but I don't think we um, entirely understand why that is yet. And so um, one thing I'm thinking about is that this might be one potential mechanism that um, could explain that relationship. So that's how I got to where we are today. Since this concept seems to be a little new to you too, and it might be new for some of our listeners. So for those who may not be familiar, before we start talking more about moral injury, sure. um, would you be able to share how you define it? Sure, sure. Um, so I think, you know, there there are a few different definitions um, in the literature that you'll come across depending on who you read. Um, I'll take kind of a more in, informal approach um, and just kind of say that, you know, certainly it starts with a moral compass, right? One's sense of right versus wrong or how the world should work or how people should behave. And then they have an experience, whether that's them doing something or them seeing somebody else do something or um, them having somebody else do something to them. And if there's a perception that, that what has happened is very inconsistent with somebody's moral compass, um, then it's likely to be experienced as, as a transgression of sorts, one that creates um, kind of a moral dissonance, if you will. And that's really where the distress part comes in. And so I think essentially what, what you'll see in the literature are just different ways of saying that it's, it's distress that follows experiences that very much violate one's moral beliefs or expectations about the world. And then, you know, I think what you see um, in terms of how people think this distress shows up are some things already mentioned, but, you know, pretty intense emotions like guilt, shame, anger, um, like I said, social functioning deficits, existential crises, um, and also kind of self, what they call self-handicapping. So self-sabotage, substance abuse, self-harm behaviors are all sort of thought to be part of this particular type of distress. Because that's a really helpful, um, you know, definition and description of what moral injury kind of looks like, you know, what's written in the literature and how, you know, that can be interpreted, um, you know, for our listeners. Is, sure. um, that's, yeah. So you've already shared a little bit about this kind of an overlap between, you know, moral injury, PTSD, and how it relates to suicide risk. But how do the so moral injury and PTSD, how do they differ? I know that there are a lot of overlapping symptoms. You've already listed off a few of them, but like depression, anger, anxiety, maybe some of those mm -hmm. self-sabotaging behaviors. So what is really different about moral injury that, um, you know, doesn't kind of present with someone with PTSD? Yeah. Well, so I think this is actually probably one of the more controversial parts of, of this literature or this conversation. Um, 
And I think we're very much still figuring that out. And I'll, I'll sort of preface my answer to this by saying, you know, uh, like I said, I'm a suicide, suicidologist by trade. I'm very, very new to the world of trauma. But, you know, m my take on it at this point, at least, is, you know, if, if you really just talk at the symptom level, then, yeah, it, it can be pretty difficult to tease apart PTSD and moral injury, especially because, you know, in the most recent edition of the DSM, they added um, a symptom cluster into the PTSD diagnosis about, you know, quote unquote, persistent negative affective states. And I think, you know, uh, that tends to cover some of the stuff that we've seen in the moral injury literature. So I think if you're just thinking about symptoms, then um, it can get pretty fuzzy. The way I, I tend to think about it is PTSD is a disorder, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and we label something a disorder in an effort to um, essentially understand an abnormality. And, you know, I think in PTSD, um, in the case of PTSD, the abnormality is really non-recovery, right? So anybody who experiences a trauma is, is likely to experience symptoms of acute stress afterwards. But we don't we don't think about it as a as a as abnormal or as a disorder per se unless those symptoms don't remit after a period of time. So, you know, to me that's kind of the essence of PTSD is is it's an intense stress reaction that persists. But if you go a little bit deeper than that, you know, we're starting I don't know if we're starting to learn, I think perhaps we've already all, always known this that stress reactions are complex, right? They happen after a lot of different kinds of experiences. They happen differently in different types of people. Um, and so I think when you get into the nuances of stress reactions is really more where this moral injury piece comes into play. And I, I tend to think about moral injury more as like a syndrome, you know, a syndrome being sort of a cluster of signs or symptoms that tend to hang together and tend to, to characterize something. And, you know, syndromes are often associated with disorders, but they aren't necessarily disorders unto themselves. And so... Um, you know, I think in the case of moral injury, you have a particular type of stress reaction that is really um, moral in nature. It's really about moral stress as opposed to stress related to danger or safety issues or stress about a uh, significant loss. And I think the other the other piece um, that's important is that, you know, morality is highly variable from person to person. So, you know, the question of whether this is a disorder or not, um, I think is a little less relevant. So I think, you know, again, it's, it's, you know, it's related to PTSD. Perhaps you could think about it sort of unofficially as maybe a, a subtype. Um, but I think in essence, they're, they're somewhat different. Okay, I really like how you frame that, that the symptoms themselves can overlap a lot and it's kind of difficult to tease out, but maybe the events that cause those symptoms are very different and how they're interpreted. So I think that's a really helpful way to um, distinguish kind of where moral injury is slightly different from PTSD, even though know, they, can, they can be happening at the same time. Right. Um, so a, thank you for providing that. I think that will be really helpful for our listeners. So you also write about how the... Um, interpersonal theory of suicide and that believing you know, one is a burden to others and feeling um, maybe disconnected can increase one's risk for suicide. How do those symptoms or maybe like syndrome of, of moral injury kind of fit in with this theory of interpersonal theory of suicide? Sure. Um, well, so, you know, I think you and I have already talked a little bit about like uh, guilt and shame, for example. And so, you know, I certainly think that if you're, you know, if you're talking about somebody who's, um, done something that, you know, makes them feel like they're, you know, this this monster, this really bad person, they have these really strong feelings of guilt and shame about it, then, you know, I think it's certainly possible that that person might think that, you know, their relationships with other people or even, even their mere existence is harmful to others, which, you know, is really what we're talking about when we talk about burdensomeness, this idea that others would be better off without you. You know, and I think if if that's how you're feeling about yourself, and those are those are strong emotions that you're having, you're also uh, more likely to pull away from other people, um, which is where I think the disconnection piece comes into play. But you know, even even in the case of you know, if it's not you yourself who have done something, maybe you've seen somebody else do something um, that really rattled you, or somebody else has done something for you, and you feel kind of a strong sense of betrayal. Um, that can really kind of shake somebody's sense of trust, you know, in other people and, and, and how things should be working. And, you know, I think that also has the potential to do damage to, to relationships in terms of making it more likely that, you know, you'll pull away from folks. 
you know, and then I think lastly, we've also talked a little bit about um, kind of disruptions in, in a sense of meaning or, or kind of purpose in life this idea that perhaps nothing matters. Um, you know, I think that can certainly sort of trickle down into social relationships that you might sort of subsequently end up putting less effort into and that can kind of end up deteriorating. So I think we talk about a lot of different kinds of symptoms in, that are associated with moral injury that can all um, have um, a pretty profound sort of social fallout. So now that you've you know, provided us with a really good um, understanding of what moral injury is, kind of how it can look like for people, would you maybe be able to provide us some examples of what a service member may experience that could lead to having a moral injury that they might either see, witness, or experience that, or something that they might do themselves? I think the one that you'll probably hear the most about or read the most about is killing. So even, you know, I think killing an, an enemy in a sort of quote-unquote justified manner will still, can still have a profound effect on somebody. I think um, you'll also hear about folks who have who have killed civilians or killed children um, during combat, whether whether intentionally or unintentionally. There was a recent study published um, that described some interviews done with veterans. So it was kind of a, a thematic sort of narrative analysis. Um, and one thing that came up repeatedly in, in that particular study was this idea of people being in in situations where they had to call in airstrikes to areas where they knew that civilians and children were present, you know, and having a really hard time sitting with that. I have had a patient who um, talked often about, you know, being in a situation where he had to he had to fire into a building um, without knowing who was in there and um, seeing blood afterwards and, and really just not knowing who had been hit or whether to what extent they had been hurt and um, having a really hard time with that ambiguity. You know, I think you also hear about atrocities. Um, you know, they're not pleasant to talk about. They they happen. Um, things like assaulting or, or torturing people, um, disrespecting remains of the deceased. People might do these things in kind of the heat of the moment um, and then have, have very different feelings about them afterwards. You know, I think uh, another thing you, you'll hear about is uh, not being able to you know, not preventing something that, that another person did. So, you know, we just talked about atrocities. You might hear somebody say, well, you know, I just kind of stood by while other people did things that I knew were wrong. I did nothing to intervene. I did nothing to stop them. I think another worth mentioning is is um, situations in which rules were not followed, you know, because um, I think in the case of veterans or, or service members, you're talking about people who operate in a very sort of rule-bound culture not following those rules, I think, can have a, an effect. Um, you know, I have a patient who, who talked about being involved in a, in a motor vehicle accident while he was deployed and um, somebody was killed. And, you know, certainly the accident and the death had an effect on him. Um, I think w what was equally um, difficult was um, his sense that he didn't take the, the appropriate uh, type of responsibility after the fact. You know, I think that's one of the things that was still haunting him. So um, really, you've got kind of a wide variety of experiences that I think have the, the potential to affect people in this sort of uh, moral way. So it seems like a lot of the veterans that we see um, have probably been exposed to a lot of those situations that you just described, especially around, um, you know, having to kill people and, and maybe people that they don't know, like who was in the building or examples like that. And it seems that a lot of veterans have been exposed to those events. So if a provider feels like they need to assess their patient for potential moral injury, what types of questions should they be asking their patient? I think this is a really great question. And, you know, I think, I think there are a couple of different routes one could go. You know, I think certainly you have the option of asking about anything specific that that person might or might not have been involved with. I might not start there um, only because I think you would really need to have the right rapport with a particular patient or really take the right um, sort of delicate approach if you're going to ask anybody directly sort of whether they've killed anyone, for example. And my sense about it is just based on, on conversations I've had with some veterans is a lot of times that sort of aspect of their service gets kind of sensationalized and might be a, a question that they have a, a strong reaction to. If you've known somebody for a while or have a good relationship with them or feel sort of skilled in taking that approach, you could ask, I think, specifically about certain things. You could also sort of take a, 
an approach where you provide a little bit of psychoeducation about at least what we think moral injury is at this point and say something along the lines of, you know, sometimes folks have experiences that really kind of um, challenge their sense of right or wrong or how things should be and, and can really have a difficult time coping with them afterwards. Did any, have you experienced anything that, that made you feel that way um, is, is a different approach. You know, and I think another option that clinicians might have is really to kind of start with, with having an education themselves about the construct and, and, you know, how we define it and how it might show up and not necessarily change the questions that they're asking um, as much as they're changing sort of or incorporating I should say, what they're listening for. So, you know, you could ask even more generally, you know, about experiences that were had and about how a person might have been affected. And if you, if you're somebody who is familiar with the construct or familiar with how it might show up in folks, then um, you can, you can sort of listen for that and respond accordingly if you, if you feel like you hear it. So in addition to, you know, what the provider's um, should be listening for when having conversations with their patients and um, asking more open-ended questions um, that might lead them to have a better understanding if they've been exposed to these events. I also understand that there are some several measures available that can also help assess for moral injury. Can you tell us a little bit more about those? Also, I think a really great question and really important piece of the, the very young field. Um, I think there are four that exist to date. I might be wrong about that. I think the first one was published uh, 2013, I want to say. There were two measures that came out, um, we'll say quote unquote earlier, 2013, 2015, um, that really focused more on events and types of events and whether folks were exposed to those types of events. So um, one of them is called the Moral Injury Event Scale. One of them is called the Moral Injury Questionnaire. And uh, my sense about it, at least, um, other people might feel differently, is that the moral injury event scale is, is the more prominent one, um, the one that's been around for the longest and, and the one that, uh, because of that, I think is the most studied. And it, it sort of classifies these types of experiences in three different ways. One is um, perpetration events, so whether, so uh, an event, something that you did. Uh, so perpetration, that would be a perpetration by self. Um, they also talk about perpetrations by others, so something that you saw other people do. Um, and then betrayal events is sort of the third category according to that measure. And then later on, as recently as um, I think 2017 and 2018, another two measures uh, were published, and these um, uh, attempted to focus more on less on, on different types of events that people are exposed to and more on um, what are the symptoms that show up, you know, how does this actually manifest. Um, and so one's called the Moral, moral Injury Symptom Scale um, and the other's called the expression, Expressions of Moral Injury Scale. And those are very new, um, have not been around um, very long and have, um, I, I at least have not seen any studies that incorporate them beyond just, you know, the, the psychometric papers that introduced them to the field. So, um, you know, it's, I think it's moving in the right direction, um, you know, because I think an important piece of, of the evidence base is going to be, you know, how does this actually show up, which will, uh, you know, allow us to ask and, and hopefully answer the question of then how do we treat it. Um, so I think it's, it's going in the right direction. It's still a very young uh, field, the measurement of moral injury at least. Thanks, Chris. And um, earlier you did share some examples of what maybe um, an event could look like of perpetration by self or others, but you mentioned that the moral injury event scale also assesses for perceived betrayals by um, both military and non-military individuals. Um, would you be able to share an example of what this type of betrayal may look like and, and how that can lead to a moral injury? I guess I have a tendency to speak in sort of clinical anecdotes uh, when it comes to questions like this, but um, I guess I, I find those helpful. Um, so I, ha I, I did at one point work with a Vietnam era veteran who, um, you know, one of the things that I think was really difficult for him was feeling like he served his country um, and came home and was treated very poorly by his fellow citizens, people who had their own reactions to the war for whatever reason, um, and really feeling like that was a betrayal, having gone to defend his country and then, and then coming home and sort of feeling like his, his country was shunning him, essentially. Um, I think he experienced that as a very deep betrayal. I've also heard about folks talk about um, 
leadership failures. You know, one person in, partic- in particular talked about being on a base where the people in charge arguably did not take security as seriously as they should have, and there was an attack and, and people were killed, and he felt like that was, that was a betrayal with the idea that folks are supposed to be able to trust leadership, and he didn't feel like they were in that situation. So I think those are two, those are two examples that I think um, kind of highlight how, how this sense of betrayal can arise and, and how it can really stick with some of these folks. I really appreciate you sharing them as like kind of clinical anecdotes because I think maybe a lot of our listeners can hear them and be like, oh, I've seen a patient that looks like that and can kind of sure. like relate it to the people that they're seeing. So I definitely um, like you sharing the clinical anecdotes that you've been exposed to. Um, oh, great. I think it, it is really helpful. Um, kind of in, in addition to, you know, helping providers um, identify if there's a moral injury, kind of understanding what those symptoms might be looking like for their patient. Um, we also you let us know that um, having a moral injury can lead to an increase in suicide risk. So mm-hmm. that's right that there's um, currently, just because the field is so new, there's not a whole lot of guidance for assessing and treating moral injury as it relates to suicide risk. So mm-hmm. any suggestions for providers on how they can use the information either gathered through, like, you know, a clinical interview or, you know, responses for any of these measures um, in their suicide risk assessment? Yeah, and I think... Probably my answer to this will be similar to kind of a part of my answer to your last question about asking specifically about moral injury. Um, I think as it pertains to suicide risk, it's it's about being educated as a clinician um, about risk factors for suicide, um, about how moral injury can present, and, and sort of tuning into the overlap. So if you feel like you might be sitting with a patient who's experienced something and possibly reporting what sounds like a moral injury, then questions to follow up about would be to what extent do they feel guilty or ashamed or have a sense of self-hate? You know, is this affecting their relationships? Do they feel connected with others? Do they feel like others are worse off because of them? You know, has this affected sort of their their general sense of, of meaning about their own life, about what they're doing, about the people that they're close to? And then if they feel like they are seeing that in some of the people that they're sitting with. And I think at that point, you know, you can transition into some of the more standard risk assessment type things where you sort of bridge that gap between, you know, sometimes people experiencing these symptoms or feeling this way, have thoughts about suicide, you know, is that anything that's come up for you? And you can do your, your sort of more pointed suicide risk assessment that really assesses for ideation and um, things like plans, preparatory behavior, intent, um, history of suicidal behavior of any kind. This is probably evident in how I'm talking about, you know, the relationship between moral injury and suicide, but it's kind of about knowing where the overlap would be um, and listening for it and and kind of bridging that gap with some of your questions. Great. Um, So we've talked a little bit about, you know, like what moral injury is, how providers can assess for it. So if a provider has determined there's a moral injury and knowing that kind of like you feelings like guilt and shame are really common for those who've been exposed to those morally injurious events. What are some treatment options for veterans who may be experiencing this guilt or shame? Is it similar to treatments for PTSD like CPT or PE, or or are there different treatments that can help target these um, feelings of guilt and shame? Well, I certainly think the the evidence-based treatments for PTSD can be helpful. Um, You know, I think you 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 can sort of tweak each of those a little bit to focus on different things that might be more salient for whomever you're working with. Um, And, you know, I definitely think there are elements of, you know, especially CPT that can, that can focus on some pretty difficult emotions like guilt and shame. I do also think bits and pieces can be taken from other evidence-based interventions. You know, um, I think a lot about DBT and I use a lot of DBT skills in my work with some of these folks because um, that's essentially what DBT teaches is, is emotion regulation. There are definitely certain skills from that treatment that I think can be applied to guilt and shame as they pertain to moral injury. You know, and then I think there are also um, sort of less well-known interventions that are out there. Um, There is a thing called trauma-informed guilt reduction. Um, I I personally don't know much about it, but I know that it exists and has been written about and is something that that folks can use to target guilt. There is also... um, an even newer treatment, um, it's called adaptive disclosure, that uh, sort of developed by a, a person named Brett Litz and, and his team in, 
he was one of the people who um, was kind of at the forefront of, of really sort of empiricizing this idea of moral injury. And, and um, he's developed a treatment that really kind of combines elements of exposure therapy with, um, with some meaning-making work and with, you know, experiential exercises, um, an example of which is, is having a corrective dialogue with a, with a trusted moral authority. That's kind of on the cutting edge. Um, and then, you know, especially if, if you're working within the VA, you know, there's, there's a pretty extensive chaplaincy network. Um, and, and for the right person for whom that might be helpful, um, I, think, I think referrals to chaplaincy services can be very helpful. Thanks, Chris. I think you've given us um, a lot to think about and how to, um, you know, be thinking about moral injury when you're working with patients and what to be listening for and, and how um, to assess for it and how to best treat it. And I really appreciate you giving us all, like, a really thorough background on that. But I mm-hmm. definitely would like to take some time to talk a little bit about your um, work that you've been doing um, mm-hmm. with regarding moral injury. So uh, you recently did a study on whether moral injury is associated with an increase in suicidal ideation among veterans with a history of substance um, use. So would you like to share a little bit about your findings from that study? Sure, yeah. This um, this was a study where we looked at, as you said, moral injury and suicide risk in veterans. And we, we separated them by um, those who had a, a history of substance abuse and those who did not. And this might be a little sort of technical, but I do feel like I want to say that when we when we ran our, our analyses, we controlled for um, things like PTSD and depression and combat exposure and cumulative trauma throughout the lifespan. So, you know, I say that just to say that, you know, we did that so that we could have more more confidence in, in the relationships that we actually did end up finding. And and what we noticed was that um, in in those without any substance abuse history, um, moral injury really had no effect on their likelihood of, of having suicidal ideation. However, if they did endorse a substance abuse history, um, their likelihood um, of having suicidal ideation um, was directly correlated with the intensity of the moral injury that they were reporting. So as one went up, the other went up with it. And, you know, th- I think the reason we feel that's relevant is because, um, you know, in, in this case, um, I think part of how we're thinking about substance abuse is as kind of a proxy for potentially for deficits in emotion regulation, right? So if some of what these people are, are dealing with are pretty intense and challenging emotions like guilt and shame, a lot of times they'll turn to, to substances to help them manage. You know, what I think that tells us is that we need to also be mindful of substance abuse as a, a possible indicator of a moral injury. Um, that really um, emotion regulation, specifically as it pertains to guilt, shame, and potentially anger, um, is kind of an important mechanism to, to think more about and continue to study as far as, as moral injury interventions go. I know that moral injury is relatively new to the field, and there's a limited amount of research out there right now. So what type of research do you hope to do to learn more about this important construct um, especially as it relates to suicide risk, um, but I'm hope, any, um, any information on studies that you're hoping to do or are currently working on? Yeah, well, um, we're working on one study right now that looks at, you know, this has come up a, little, a few times in our conversation, um, meaning. So we're looking at a study right now that um, looks at to what extent do, do folks have a sense of, of meaning and can that, does that protect one from developing a moral injury after a particular experience? Does that help one recover from a moral injury after a particular experience? It's, it's an example of trying to, I think, a little bit more about some of the specific mechanisms that are involved um, because it's, it's the kind of, uh, moral injury I think is a little bit like PTSD and that not everybody who's necessarily exposed to something is going to develop a moral injury. Part of it is kind of what, what differentiates an instance where someone develops one from an instance where someone does not. So that's a little bit of kind of where mechanisms work, I think, could be helpful. Because I'm a suicidologist, I, of course, am, am interested in suicide risk. Literature on moral injury in general is, is limited right now. Research on moral injury and suicide risk is even, is even more limited. We don't really know why it's associated with suicide risk right now. It's, I think, speculative at this point. So certainly more definitive um, studies where that's explained more definitively would be helpful. Also, I mean, what kind of suicide risk? You know, is it risk for suicide ideation? Is it risk for suicide attempts? Is it risk 
for deaths by suicide and and do different types of events or different types of morally injurious experiences affect suicide risk differently that's another piece and then you know lastly i think i think we have good interventions and i think our interventions can always be improving so the more we understand about like I said before, specific mechanisms, the more we understand how they affect things like suicide risk, um, the more information we have to make either adapt existing interventions or um, develop new ones that are maybe a little more targeted. So that's kind of a, a general answer to your question about where I hope to go in the future. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Well, it all sounds really exciting, and I think that there is so many places for you know the field to go, like just understanding moral injury better and what is it and then how does it relate to suicide risk and, mm-hmm. and all these other things since they're all interconnected and can influence one another. So really having a good understanding of, of why that is, I think that's a great, um, you know, direction for the field to go in and looking forward to seeing, you know, kind of where your research takes you um, as mm-hmm. you progress in your career. Um, yeah, I appreciate so we, it. Um, yeah, and we really do appreciate your time, Chris, today. I think you provided us with so much helpful information from providers working with veterans and things just to be thinking about and maybe learning more about um, since mm-hmm. moral injury is new and um, maybe some people haven't really heard about it or they heard about the term but don't really know what that means. So I think you've definitely given us all a lot of helpful things to be thinking about as we work with our veterans. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any other closing remarks or anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners today? Um. I I really don't. Um, other than to say that I you know I I appreciate your your group bringing bringing attention to the topic, um, and I and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak more about it. I think um, yeah, I think it's great. All right. Well, thank you again, Chris. And that is it for our our, our short takes podcast today. We really appreciate you for listening, uh, listeners. You can learn more about moral injury by clicking on the links accompanying this podcast. You can also reach out to us if you have any um, comments or questions about what we discussed today. Uh, Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast, give us a review, and share with colleagues. Join us next time for more interviews on important work in suicide prevention.